We turn this evening to Psalm 71. Psalm 71. You'll see that the psalm does not have a title and therefore it's difficult to locate it at a particular time in the life of David. But it would be fair to say that this psalm was written toward the end of his reign and very likely around the time of the rebellion of Absalom. What is clear is that from the beginning of the psalm, he begins by praying to the Lord for deliverance in verse 1 through 4. And then he bolsters his own heart from verse 5 and following, where he sets really before himself and the Lord grounds for his confidence. And then from verse 14 to the end, on the basis of that confidence, he declares his determination to pursue the Lord with all of his heart. So like many of these psalms that don't have titles, we're reminded that we don't really need titles because this is a book that God has given to the church in all ages. And the truths here are generic for us. Christians need these kinds of things in every age that we are called to live in the church of Christ. What is apparent as you read down through these verses is that David has been serving God for a long time now. And in that period, he has seen many troubles, persecution from Saul right through to the time of Absalom. And he refers to them in verse 20 of the psalm. Thou which has showed me great and sore troubles shall quicken me again and shall bring me up again from the depths of the earth. He's evidently arrived at old age. And so in verse 9, he refers to this, Cast me not off in the time of old age, forsake me not when my strength feeleth. And then again in verse 18, Now also when I am old and grey-headed, O God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to every one that is to come. So he's an aged believer in Psalm 71. The part of the psalm that I direct your attention to tonight is verse 14 through 16, where David is recording his resolution to press on in faithfulness to the end. You could think of a distance runner, and he's been on the track now for some time, he's getting weary, and yet he knows that there is still uh, somewhat left of the race to go. He's feeling the strain. He's asking How am I going to get to the end? How am I going to run what is left of my race? These verses give us the answer. David tells us, this is how I'm going to do it. Gray hairs or not, I'm going to keep pressing on in service of the Lord. Listen to verse 14 through 16. But I will hope continually... And will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. For I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness. Even of thine only. Our theme then from these verses is keep pressing on. Now to help us consider first of all that you are to press on in hoping. Press on in hoping. How are we going to get to the end of this race? We've been running for a time and we're weary. Verse 14, we press on in hoping. In the previous verse, David has been considering his enemies and he says, Lord, confine them and put them to confusion. But in contrast to that, Lord, I am going to hope in you continually. Now, the word hope here means to wait patiently. And in many ways that actually captures the biblical idea of hope. When the Bible speaks of hope, it doesn't mean that we wish for something or that we dream about something or would like something to come to pass. When the Bible speaks of hope, it's more that the believer is waiting in expectation. 
So you pick up our 1650 Psalter, you come to this verse, and you'll sing, but I with expectation will hope continually. And you might think, well, the translators are adding words to this. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible just says, I will hope continually. But in actual fact, the Bible does say that because to hope and to wait with expectation, it's all found in that Hebrew word that's being translated. That's one of the advantages of the metrical version, although there are disadvantages to it, but one of the advantages is it allows the translators to unpack sometimes the fullness that's in a Hebrew word. You know that the Bible refers to the return of Christ as the blessed hope of the church. Well, that, what does that mean if it doesn't mean that we in this world are waiting with expectation for something that is certain to take place? David says, I will hope continually. Well, in the same way that we hope for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and are confident in it, so you and I are to hope for everything else that God has promised to us in Christ. We're to wait for it with expectation. So consider, consider David here. David, when he says, I will hope continually, is no doubt thinking about everything that God has covenanted to be to him and to do for him. God says, David, I'm going to put your seed upon the throne. I'm going to establish your throne forever. Your seed is going to sit upon that throne. And indeed, that throne is going to endure forever. David pens psalms like Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. That was promised to David. Wonderful promise of Christ. Well, to get a flavor of this, please turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. 2 Samuel 23, when, when David comes to the end of his life. And there he really sets the whole of his hope before us in verse 5. 2 Samuel chapter 23 in verse 5. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. For this is all of my salvation and all my desire, although he make it not to grow. That's a very interesting statement. David looks at his house and he says, circumstantially, my house seems to contradict your promise. Lord, you've promised that you would bless my household. You've promised that you would establish my throne. But one son rapes my daughter, the other son kills that son, and then he rebels against me in a civil war. What's going on? Has the promise of God failed? No, David in terms of Psalm 71 is going to hope continually. And he says, Lord, whatever I see, whatever I feel, I know this. You have established a covenant that is ordered in everything and certain and sure. And you're going to fulfill it. Even though now when I look out, it doesn't seem to prosper. How are you going to get to the end of your race, David? I'm going to hope continually. I'm going to hope even against hope. I'm going to hope when it's dark. Spurgeon comments, we may always hope. Because as Christians, we always have ground for it. Well, consider your own life. Things change, don't they? Relationships change. Prosperity changes. Health changes. But the Bible assures us that God can't change, nor can the word of his promise to his people. And that's why we can hope like David in the dark when we don't see the promise being evidently fulfilled in an obvious way. Indeed, when everything seems to contradict it, 
When we look outside and everything appears to be against us, and then we look inside and even our own hearts so often seem to contradict the promises of God, God's word is true. And therefore, the believer can still say, I'm going to hope. Even though I don't see it prosper, I'm going to wait with expectation. And then when we evaluate all of our troubles and trials in this light, what do we discover but that in the midst of them and through them, God is actually strengthening this hope that we are exercising. Remember how Paul deals with this in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 as he's presenting some of the fruits of our justification. He says this in verse 3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Another word for that would be endurance. And patience, experience, and experience, hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So Paul says, when God brings trouble into your life, you're hoping in God, but the very experience that you pass through is strengthening that hope that you hope with. And the more you hope, the more you endure. It's like God's feeding the hope that we hope with through trials and tribulations that come into our lives. Well, don't you see it here in Psalm 71? This aged believer who has been through many trials and tribulations before. And not only does he say in verse 14, I will hope continually. But if you look back at verse 5, he says of God, you are my hope. Indeed, you've been my hope the whole of my life. For thou art my hope, O Lord God, and thou art my trust from my youth. Hope helps us to deal with trials and to strengthen through it. But then in the midst of all that, hope motivates our Christian service. We were at a funeral, many of us, on Saturday. The last text of scripture that was read at the graveside, I believe, was this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, forasmuch as ye know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why does Paul end 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with those words? Because he has just set out the glorious hope of the believer. The certainty of our resurrection at the last day because Christ has died and destroyed death. Therefore, in the face of the grave, we say, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Christ is conquered. But Paul doesn't leave it there with a statement of doctrine or telling us what will be. He brings it back into this world and he says, because this is true, because you have this hope, therefore get on with it. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. How do we press on, brethren? We press on, first of all, here. In hoping. But then secondly, we press on in praising. But I will hope continually, and yet, and will yet praise thee more and more. Do you see how hoping continually here leads to praising continually? Hoping continually leads to praising continually. Everything is increasing. Everything is expanding in the experience of this believer. Hopeless souls are praiseless souls. Now, I don't say that they're songless souls. 
In fact, hopeless souls can be full of songs. Some of them are empty songs and many of them are miserable songs. The person who looks at life and doesn't have any hope will often go in to himself. And writers have borne these songs in pain. And then they sing them with a lot of feeling and angst. Now it happened throughout history. I think this kind of despairing song has really come to the fore in the last 50 years as the worldview of our nation has collapsed. When I was growing up in the 90s, there were loads of them. We had the grunge scene. We had bands then coming out of that like Nirvana and young people today who weren't around then like to go around wearing t-shirts with Nirvana on them. Nirvana being ultimately the search for peace and nothingness. Yet when you listen to the songs full of pain, full of anger, full of despair, and the one who sang them with such feeling and pathos died despairingly taking his own life. I say hopeless souls are praiseless souls. They're not songless souls. But the Christian does not live and die in despair. No, the Christian has something to sing about and the more and more he hopes, the more and more he praises so that the whole trajectory of his life continues like that. You see it here in David, his heart is firmly fixed. He's determined that he's going to live a life of praise. Well, why ought our lives to be marked by pressing on in praising God? Well, first of all, because praise glorifies God. And you as a Christian desire to glorify God. Therefore, you will be praising him. Think about it here in verse 14. David is declaring what he's going to do. I'm going to hope continually, Lord, and I'm going to praise you more and more. He's telling us what he's going to do while he is in the very act of composing a song that he's going to do it with. Giving it to you and I in the church that we might show forth the same praise. We can sing of God's greatness, can't we? Like David here in verse 19, Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. Who has done great things, O God? Who is like unto thee? We're pressing on in the Christian life. The thought of God lays hold of our hearts. And when you and I begin to contemplate upon the person's and the, the glory of the Godhead, and we consider what he has done, our theological reflection will instinctively bring forth doxology and praise. If it doesn't, brethren, you're not doing it right. We sing of the greatness of God. We sing of the salvation of God, having tasted it ourselves. We're going to say more of it when we come to look more carefully at verse 15 and verse 16. But see how salvation is at the center. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. So here he says, salvation consumes my heart. And that salvation is not merely to my benefit, but it is all to your glory, O Lord. Therefore, as I press on in the Christian life, I'm singing about God's greatness. I'm singing about God's salvation. And as I do that, I'm singing in defiance. I'm singing in defiance of all of my enemies. 
and I'm singing in the face of all of my troubles. That's what David's doing here in, in Psalm 71, whatever these troubles are. He writes a song about them. And he begins to sing. And that's the way that the saint trods to heaven. God has given us a book of them. Just think of the things that we sing. Psalm 124. Israel persecuted time and time again. Now Israel may say, and that truly, if not that the Lord had not our cause maintained. What would have happened? We would have been overwhelmed. But so many times we've been, been like the bird that has escaped out of the fowler's snare. Or Psalm 129. Oft have they vexed me from my youth. Now Israel may say. But they weren't victorious. Or Psalm 57. That we sang a little earlier this evening. Where David is surrounded by enemies and he cries to God, Lord, preserve me. Keep me from their, their cruelty and their wickedness. And the bit that we didn't sing from verse 7 to the end. He says, my heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory, awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. David is concerned that God is glorified in the midst of his trials. And he says, I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing his praises. So we press on in praising because praise glorifies God. But then we also press on in praising because praise edifies us. We're Christians. We desire to glorify God, but we also desire to be built up in our own Christian lives. Therefore, we're going to praise God. Just think about those ways that we've just considered of how we praise God, give honor to Him, yes, but they also benefit us. So we praise God for His greatness. What happens when you do that as a believer? Well, here you are in this world looking at all these trials and tribulations. You might say, like David, my house is not so with God. I can't see the promise flourishing. But then you get your eyes off your trials and you get them fixed upon God. What happens now? Your soul is strengthened, isn't it? So as we begin to think about God and praise Him, we lift our souls out of discouragement. We're edified. Then we praise God for salvation. And the more we consider that and sing to God uh, about that, we feed our hope so that we're strengthened to endure in the life that is set before us. We say to ourselves in such songs, even though it's hard for me, even though there are many discouragements that I face, he has saved me, he is saving me, and he will save me. And then when we praise in defiance of all of our trials, don't we strengthen and encourage our own hearts? Sometimes, if truth be told, we, we stand fearful before many things in our lives, don't we? And if we could only begin to raise the song of the redeemed in the face of those things, how our hearts would be encouraged. You remember Paul and Silas in Philippi? They saw Lydia converted the beginnings of a little church form. And then they're accused falsely and cast into prison. And we're told at midnight, Paul and Silas began to sing praises unto God. What were they doing? They were singing praises in defiance of their trials and their tribulations. 
how many times that's been the case. We began our worship this evening singing Psalm 46. If you could go back to the 16th century to Wittenberg and see there Martin Luther with all of his ups and downs and his emotional swings. And sometimes things are going so well and other times they're terribly discouraged and he goes to Melanchthon and he says, Philip, come, let's sing the 46th Psalm. What's he doing? He's singing praise in defiance of his trials. Or the Huguenots in France who went to their death singing the psalm, so much so that their infuriated persecutors would take the pages of their psalm books, cut out their tongues, and shove the pages of their psalm books into their mouths. They died with these songs upon their lips, brethren, edifying and strengthening their own hearts in the face of vehement persecution. How do we press on then in the Christian life? We press on in praising God. Is praise a prominent thing in your daily experience? Oh, you read the Bible, I hope, and you pray. But does this not challenge us that we ought to daily come before God in praise? And the more that you praise him, the more you will hope in him. The more you will be strengthened to persevere. Friends, David is obsessed with this point in this psalm. Verse 14, I will praise him more and more. But look at verse 6. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. And then he's back to it again in verse 8. Let my mouth be filled with thy praise and with thine honor all the day. Do you sing God's praises in the closet? Do you sing God's praises in your family? Do you actually think about what you're singing or is it just, oh, it's the motion of family worship again? Do you really praise him in your family worship? Do you get in the car and as you drive along, do you sing God's praise? When you come to church, do you praise him? When you bow in prayer, do you praise him? David says, here's how I'm going to get to the end of the race. I'm going to hope and I'm going to praise. And then thirdly, we press on in testifying. Two verbs in verse 15 and verse 16 describe this action. My mouth shall show forth. That's the first one. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. Two words that mean to recount, to mark, to record, or, or to declare. Well, then what are we to witness to? Well, verse 15 tells us that we are to witness to God's righteousness and salvation. And then in verse 16, he repeats the word righteousness. He's going to make mention of the righteousness of God. Now, David is not just merely focused here on one attribute of God, as if, as if this was the only thing that he was going to praise God for. No, he speaks of righteousness in relation to salvation, and the Bible does this frequently. The Psalms are full of this. They link righteousness and salvation. They show to us that God delivers or saves his people in accordance with his righteousness. Prophets do the same thing. Who is God going to save us by? He will save us by one whose name is Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Now when Luther came to Psalm 31, he was faced with a problem. 
Because he read the psalmist's prayer that God would deliver him in his righteousness. And the righteousness of God made Martin Luther tremble. He said to himself, I'm a sinner, God is righteous. How on earth could God who is righteous ever deliver me in that righteousness? His righteousness demands my death. Do you know where he found his answer? He found it in Romans chapter 1, where Paul tells us that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is really all about righteousness. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. This was the key that unlocked everything for Luther. God can deliver me by his righteousness because the gospel reveals that righteousness and says to the sinner, this righteousness is yours if you will but only believe. The just shall live by faith. He read on, Romans chapter 3, verse 24 and following, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearing of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justified of him which believeth in Jesus. Now take all of that back to Psalm 71, verse 15 and verse 16. What are we to witness to? We are to witness to God's wonderful deliverance and salvation of sinners in the gospel of his Son, in which he is righteous or just, and at the same time, the justifier of the ungodly sinner in Christ. How are we going to press on to the end? We're going to set the gospel at the very center of everything we think and do. And we're going to testify to the faithfulness of God in saving sinners. We're going to wonder in amazement at it that he saved us. And we are going to be convinced that this God is able to save others also. But then what or when are we to witness to it? What are we to witness to? We're to witness to this righteous salvation. But when? Verse 15. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. For I know not the numbers thereof. All the day is singular. To know the numbers thereof is plural. The question arises, what's he referring to here? Well, all the day is a Hebrew idiom that just means continually. The way he has spoke of continually hoping and praising God more and more. Now he's saying, I'm going to testify to God's salvation continually, all the day, all the time. But then he adds to that, for I know not the numbers thereof. Is he referring there to the days? Is he saying, I'm going to do this all the day because I don't know how many more days God is going to give me in this earth? If he's saying that, of course it would be perfectly true. And the thought then would be urgency. I'm going to witness to these things because there's an urgency about it. And the day is going to come when my tongue will rest silent in the grave. Well, that's a possible interpretation of this verse. I would submit to you that it's more likely he means this. I'm going to witness all the day, that is continually, for I know not the numbers, and that is linked to God's salvation and his righteousness. And it's as if he's saying, I'm going to do it all the day, 
because it's so wonderful and there's so much to tell. I cannot sum it all up. And therefore, I'm going to continue hoping and I'm going to continue praising and I'm going to continue testifying to God's glorious mercy towards sinners in Christ. Either way, brethren, it's continual hope, perpetual praise, and constant witness to our Savior. Just think about that in those terms. How are we going to press on to the end? Testifying of these things. Well, surely we're going to testify of them to the world, because we know that without this message of salvation, sinners are going to perish and be lost eternally. If you know this salvation yourself, there will be an urgency within your soul that you share this glorious knowledge with other people. So you're going to testify of these things to the world. But then you're also going to testify of these things to yourself. That's vital. For you to persevere in the Christian life, you could almost call this your daily work. So many problems come into your spiritual experience because you fail to do this. You start to think of duty, and then you see your failure. And you get overwhelmed with guilt and shame. And you sit down, and you beat upon your breast, and you say, woe is me, and you make no progress. But the psalmist says, I am going to testify of God's righteous Salvation, and I'm going to do it every day, continually. Do you see how much you need this as a Christian in your life when you fall into sin? What have you to do? You have to remind yourself of the grace of God toward you in Christ. That when you sin, He forgives, He restores, He heals. When you faint, because you feel this Christian way is too great for you, you need to do the same thing again. You need to testify to yourself all the day of God's righteousness and his salvation. That God who has saved you is saving you and will save you. And he has covenanted to you to never let you go. Do you testify like that to yourself? This righteous salvation of verse 15 and verse 16 is really the bedrock of all of our hoping and all of our praising in verse 14. So press on. Press on in hoping. Press on in praising. Press on in testifying. But finally, press on in relying. Verse 16 I will go in the strength of the Lord. Press on in relying. Why is it that you fail to make the pro progress that you desire in the Christian life? You say, well, pastor, that's a very complex question. Amen. It is. It's a very complex question indeed. And you could answer the question really by all of the three previous three points. Why don't I make progress? Because I'm not hoping as I should be. I'm not praising as I should be. And I'm not testifying as I should be. But it's more likely that you're not making progress in the Christian life for this reason. That you feel to practically acknowledge this truth. And you're not casting yourself in reliance upon Christ for everything. Now you come to verse 16. You read, I will go in the strength of the Lord. It doesn't really register to you. It's that profound. You know it. You have this notional idea that this is so. But here's the problem even though this is true, you keep trying to live the Christian life without it. It's like you recognize, well, I've been saved by grace and I have the Holy Spirit. 
And it's like God pours a little bit of grace and the Holy Spirit in at the beginning and says, now, you get on with living the Christian life. And you imagine that you can survive the Christian life with that initial charge, if you like. But you can't. He must work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure every day and for every duty that he calls you to fulfill. And if you are not relying on his strength, you're not going to make any progress. I've been reading through the autobiography of Robert Blair, who was one of the first Presbyterian ministers in Northern Ireland. He was also a member of the Church of Scotland General Assembly in 1638 that cast off uh, prelacy. And then he became minister of St. Andrews. Blair describes around 1622 a period of unusual barrenness in his life that, that caught him off guard. All was going well. He was teaching at the University of Glasgow. And then it felt to him that he was kind of paralyzed. He wanted to sanctify the Lord's day. He wanted to profit from the means of grace. And he threw himself into these things with much effort, but yet they proved fruitless to his soul. This disturbed him. He became so discouraged that his friends and colleagues could see it in his face. They asked him had he lost his assurance of salvation. He said no. He had full confidence in Christ and that his soul was safe. But that no matter what he tried to do, he didn't seem to be able to make any progress in the Christian life. He read this text of scripture and it changed everything. I will go in the strength of the Lord. He says, I have been so foolish. I imagine that the stock of grace within my heart was sufficient to enable me to live the whole of the Christian life. But God brought me to recognize that I needed to be daily equipped and daily help for everything that I do. Moreover, he said, God showed him what was really in his heart and that was the remaining stock of sin. And he brought him to face up to that Christian paradox, as he called it. That it is only when I am weak that I can be strong. Has Christ taught you that this evening? That Christian paradox, so contradictory to everything else that we know in this world. In the world, you progress in proportion as you realize strength, don't you? But in the Christian life, you progress in proportion to your recognition of your own weakness. Because that weakness is the only thing that will ultimately drive you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Your self-sufficiency will never take you there. But when he brings you to that place where you recognize that all that you have is need, then you will go to the one who alone is able to meet that need. You want to press on in the Christian life. You need to go in the strength of the Lord. Otherwise you're just going to be stuck in the mud. Spinning your wheels. And going nowhere. We have a template here therefore. Of Christian preservation. And Christ is ever at the center of it all isn't he? We have to go in his strength. But that's true of each of the other three points. We're going to hope continually, but we're going to hope more and more in Christ. And we're going to praise continually, but we're going to praise more and more of Christ. And we're going to testify continually. And we're going to speak more and more of Christ. And we're going to rely continually.
and the whole weight of our soul, we're going to rest on Jesus Christ. Brethren, that is how we are to press on to the end of this race that God has called us to run. May God's blessing be upon the preaching of his word.